resume their seats? Or next Hi everyone, we're going to get started in a few minutes. Um, we just wanted to make sure that any gaps that are between you, um, if you can make room for anyone else that hasn't made, hasn't got a seat, because I think there are a few gaps in between, if you can, people can move over maybe, or just create a bit of space for people to come in as we're all moving in. So it gives us great pleasure to welcome a speaker that's come from Western Australia, obviously my home state with us today, Mary Louise Bertram, um, who'll be speaking to you today, advocating for communication. So let's welcome Mary. Thank you. Oh. Hello, have I got voice? All right. Um, my name's Mary Louise. Um, I am a teacher by trade. And uh, when I started teaching, I was very fortunate in that I was plonked into a school where everyone had a communication system and that's just what you did. So I didn't know any different. Um, I thought, I assumed that that's what all special schools around the world were like. Um, it was only when I started um, working more online and in forums, Facebook wasn't really big then, but in forums that, and I started saying, oh yes, all the children are doing this and they're saying this and this is what they're writing with their alternative pencils and families were like, excuse me, what? What are you talking about? Um, so I had to step back and, and sort of learn about what on earth's going on in the rest of the world. I am now, um, I left teaching in 2010. My journey with advocacy started probably when I was a teenager and I was the world's most painful teenager and my journey with advocacy was trying to learn how to play the game. Um, I was often outside the principal's office with her sister saying, Bertram, is that you? What, where should you be? What should you be doing? Play the game, sister, play the game. Yes, and sister would say, this is not your tribe, Mary Louise. This is not your tribe, this is not your people, play the game, get your certificate, get out and find your tribe. So all my life is kind of how do I advocate, how do I find my tribe without putting everyone offside when everyone drives me mad because they're not doing the thing I want. <laughs> um, so the next step with advocacy came when I had to leave uh, teaching in 2010 when I had stage 4 cancer. And it was how, initially it was you know, I have never been in your position. The only position I can say that I've had to learn to advocate from is being sat down with 15 specialists essentially saying, so what did you want to do with your life? Because you've got to do it now. And then going into appointments and having um, you know, the oncology professor sit there and not ask any questions, not make eye contact, not look at me, not inquire about who I was as a person, what my interests were, what I wanted to do with my life. This, I became a file. And the day that really got me was when I was sitting, there was a young fellow, oncology fellow there, and he was examining all my lymph nodes, so I was naked, and um, he was talking to me. And the oncology professor said, you don't have to talk to her. And I said, well, actually, he's got his hands on my boobs, so I really would prefer he did. Um, and I thought, oh my god, you know, you're thrust into this when every fibre of your being is saying, run the other way, when every fibre of your being is saying, scream, cry, go and collapse in a hole, hide, put the doona over your head, I do not want to come out, can the world just stop? How do you step up and keep going? And so my, my journey with cancer, my journey with all the other stuff that's happened in life, and my journey teaching children with most complex needs, caring for children with the most complex needs, and working with families of children with the most complex needs. How do we get people to play our game? Um, so that's my big thing. Um, now, I do get nervous when I present and sometimes swear words come out, so um, hopefully we can edit that later. Um, but I, um, yeah, so this is why I do what I do. For me, communication is the essence of human life. It's why we exist. We exist to share stories with other people, to share our inner selves with other people, our personalities, our desires, our dreams. 
And so this is what, as speaking people, we focus on how can we become the most awesome person? How can I share my personality? How can I get that hot guy at the bar to come over here to me? Um, or how can I at least meet him halfway and make eye contact? But when I go into so many special schools around the world, this is what I see. The communication is reduced to what do you want and need right now? Do you need more or are you finished? On what I decided, you're going to have more and finished. And do you need the toilet or do you need something to eat or drink? So my big issue is, if we are focusing on that, what are we teaching the children matters? If we are focusing purely on that, what are we teaching the children inadvertently doesn't matter? So how do we get people to do this, embrace this whole communication thing? So we're on borrowed time here, so I'm going to go boom, boom, boom. Um, so this is my kind of top five for how we work and get AAC systems in schools, in um, age, uh, group home and older care settings, in daycares, in ICU, <coughs> in hospitals. Because um, I'm, I'm kind of the person that's brought in when everything's gone to poo. So I know there is amazing, awesome practice out there but I'm the one that's brought in when nobody's talking to each other anymore, when the parents are battle-weary, when they've got therapist fatigue, when the teacher has decided she doesn't need to be told what to do by the speech therapist anymore, <coughs> when everyone is on their own agenda, that's when I come in. So this is kind of like experience from the trenches, this is how we try and do it. The most important thing we have learnt is that you have to have a vision. Your vision changes and grows, but before you start talking about AAC systems, before you start talking about school placements, you have to have a vision. There are, and it is really, really hard for a lot of our families and a lot of therapists and teachers to get this idea of, well, what, what are you talking about? Well, actually, I'm talking about a vision. If I've got a five-year-old in front of me, I need to think about what adult life is like. So let's think about, mm, okay, adult life. What makes a really rich life? Friendships. Friendships can happen in special schools, friendships can happen in mainstream schools, friendships can happen in family and cousin environments. But friendships are key because it's that connection that communication is for. Reciprocal relationships. So it's not just one way that I am contributing to this relationship through my choices, through my personality, through the little jokes I play, through the beautiful sounds and vocalisations that I make, through the communication that I have. I have something to give. The world needs your sons and daughters and they do have something to give. So reciprocal relationships are key. And we have to say this to teachers of little kids because if we don't start helping them think of a vision in so many teachers and therapists' mindsets still is sheltered workshop is the end product, then why on earth would I teach communication and literacy now if that's the end product? No, 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 let's think big. Sheltered workshops, supported work, supported accommodation, there is nothing wrong with that. But you need to have a rich life if that's a part of it, just as you need to have a rich life if employment is a part of your life. You need to have experiences, hobbies, work, education. That is part of the rich life that we need to start problem solving in order to advocate for a vision. Uh, we use a lot of person-centred planning tools. You can have as many as you want, gorgeous. Um, we use a, a company called Universe, which makes microboards, which is a, a small kind of board of awesomeness that surrounds a person to help them have a rich life, to help them plan. Um, the Developmental Disability Council of Western Australia, because I'm in Perth a lot, um, they do some amazing preparing to plan tools and planning tools and they can share that with other organisations around the country. You know, the more we move towards NDIS, my way, your life, your way, all the different ways the, the country is doing it, planning is key. If you want an AAC system, it has to be part of your plan. So how is that going to fit into the big picture? So rich life is part of the vision. The next part of the vision is that, okay, if I'm having a rich life, I need to be able to make choices about what I'm doing. So autonomy and control and choice in a person with a disability's life is so important. 
And yes, we can have choices that people give, but you need a way to say, that's the one I want. You know, choice making is a skill and this is what I work on so often with schools. I go in there and the family is saying, he needs AAC, she needs AAC and the school's like, well, we're just working on choice making at the moment. Um, has anyone had that? We're just working between choosing between two symbols. We're just working on more and finish. We're just working on choice making. Choice making is a skill. So if you hit this, in any of your schools, in any of your therapists. This is what we do around the world. We say to the staff, all right, and I want you to do it now. When, you, when we leave here this afternoon, I want you to think inside your head what you really, really want to do. If you could do anything, don't tell anyone, but think inside your head, oh God, this afternoon I'm gonna be knackered, my brain feels like it's gonna explode. If there's one thing I could do, what would it be? So now I say to you, all right, so this afternoon, after we've finished here, you have two choices. We can go bowling or to the shopping centre. Okay, so who wants to go bowling? Oh, looking very blankly. Some people are giving eye contact. Someone's got their hand up. I guess most of us are going to the shopping centre. Now, if you didn't want either of those, I mean, you're all pretty high-functioning people. Well, everyone told, I assumed you were high-functioning because you're at a conference. <laughs> so you've just proved to me that if I give you two choices, both of you, all of you are sitting there. This is the position we put the children in. Either you go passive and go, well, I don't actually want any of those, so I'm really praying that a third option appears. <laughs> So I'm just going to do this because I really want to go out to dinner tonight and have a whole lot of champagne. So I'm just going to do this. But that tells all the experts around you, you're not ready for choice making. <laughs> so you've gone passive. The other option is, the other op thing for you to do is you have to choose of the two crappy options. What is the less crappy option for you? And for some of us it was shopping centre. And then... You know, so if you think about what the young people that we work with and know and love, when they're in this position, okay, it's bowling or shopping centre. Oh, well, you didn't want bowling, I guess we're going shopping centre. I don't want to see any behaviours, any anxiety, anything, because you chose shopping centre. <laughs> this is what we do to the kids and the adults. And only when we put ourselves in this position do we go, e. And the thing is, We've all done it. We've all got to own it. So what do we do? When we know better, we do better. What we do is add in different. Ooh, bowling, shopping centre, something different. Ooh, everyone's over here, something different. Ooh, another couple of options might appear. For many of the girls, it's bowling, shopping centre, none of those. Because actually, I just want to sit here. What would you like? Mm, pink nail polish, blue nail polish, none of those. No, I don't want any nail polish. I don't want to have to choose between blue and pink nail polish because I like my nails the way they are now. So different means that other things appear. Something else means other things appear. None of those choices means <laughs> that actually now choice making is powerful for me and it's not another way for you to boss me around. When we want people who are AAC users to embrace their AAC, to embrace these symbols, it has to be power for them, not another way for adults to boss them around. Um, so again, we've got different, something else, none of those. The other part of the vision is language. Um, language and written language of literacy, learning to read and write. So we have to have a rich life, we have to have some control over that life, and we need to have language. So when we think about our vision, how do we advocate for what we want language-wise? The goal is, the end goal for anybody is that they can say what they want to say to whoever they want to say it, whenever they want to say it. And these aren't my words. These are Linda Burkhart's and Gail Porter's words. But that's the goal. That's the end destination. And this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. It takes time, energy, effort, but we have to keep that there, have to keep that. I want her to be able to talk to anyone because then I know that she's safe, I know that she'll have 
Uh, she can communicate with all sorts of people around her. I know she can share her awesomeness with people. That's the goal. And if we think about what, do, what is language, why do any of us bother communicating, we have to know what we're actually talking about when we're talking about language. So when we think about why do we communicate, this is why we ask questions. We greet friends and family. We comment on things, we say I like something, I don't like something, we indicate there's a problem. It might be that my iPad's uh, battery's flat, it might be that I've got horrific re reflux, but there's a problem. Um, we complain, that really sucks. We indicate a preference, we make choices, we make requests. We tell what's happening in the past, we tell what's happening in the future. We tell jokes, we share secrets, we boss people around. If, if your life is all about other people doing things for you, if you have very little control over your life, the power of using your AAC to boss people around is huge. I go into teenage classrooms in special schools and there's 15 year old boys with ASD and all their life they've had 40 to 50 year old women telling them what to do as their life in a special school because that's just the population of aides and teachers. You're trying to say to them, actually, you know, this proloquo, this pod, this whatever is, is power for you. Guess what? When they use it to tell the aides what to do, jump. Shake your bum. Kick. Shimmy, sit down, jump, sit down, stand up. Then it's like, ooh, I got the power. So we have to say, this is power for you. This is language. This is why we communicate. This is why we bother, because it's bloody hard work. So it has, the result of the effort has to be worth the effort. We have to be able to pretend. We have to incorporate pretend play with our girls. We have to incorporate play in general. Because when a child can talk about play with their AAC, when they can pat a doll like this, suddenly people go, ooh, she's smart. The children that I work with with Angelman syndrome, there's a huge difference in the way people react to the child when they're chewing on the doll's foot to when the doll's on the table and they're pat, pat, patting. People go, oh, she understands. Well, yes, but do you know what? The difference was between chewing on the doll and patting the dolly on the back. That was six months of hardcore play. We, can't, we don't just expect typical toddlers to know what to do. They've seen it around them. So we have to do that with kids with disabilities too. We have to provide that. So when people are saying, well, your child isn't ready for this, your child isn't um, communicating in the way we would like to see, what actually is your child communicating? We use lots and lots of um, communication inventories, but the one that has um, been most embraced by the families of parent and parents I work with around the world is the pragmatics profile. Because basically it's just an interview. When, your child, when you're in the kitchen and your child wants more of something, what does she do? Well, she vocalises, she rocks towards it, she reaches, she stares at it. Oh wow, she's doing all this stuff about requesting. When she comes home from school and she wants to tell you about what she did in the day, how is she doing that? Well, she doesn't. Okay, so if your child can do all these amazing things with requesting, you better make sure that your AAC system doesn't just focus on requesting. Because what we see so often is the children are using their multimodal methods to communicate so much. And every single, some of the kids have 30 different ways of requesting. And they change those ways depending if it's dad or mum or grandma, because they know who is watching for what. But then they head to the speech therapist and the speech said, we're going to start with pecs because we need to just work on requesting. No, no, no. See, I filled this out. She's got requesting down. She's not commenting. She's not complaining. She's not bossing people around. So can your pec system do that? If not, we need to look at something else. So when you've got the data behind you, when you know what you're talking about, when you're entering this disability land of acronyms, this helps. This gives you some more power in the relationship with the therapists. Um, there are lots of communication and AAC systems out there. Um, the main three that are used um, around the world with the uh, um, people with RET and other disabilities that I work with is core vocabulary systems, so anything on communicator, it's on a primo, it's on a flex, um, uh, proloquo, core vocab systems, unity or minspeak, and then pod. 
So they're the three systems, robust language systems that are being used by children and girls and adults with RET around the world. So again, it has to be able to do all this. If it's a robust communication system and it's worth having, it has to be able to do all this. And not all of this is gonna come in the first week when you get the device, when you get the system, but it has to be able to grow with you so you can say all these things. So when we're advocating for an AAC system, we have to think, oh, okay, we're actually advocating for language. My child can't meet all her <coughs> communication needs with speech. She needs language. So how do we learn language? When you were in the hospital, in the maternity ward with your typically developing baby, and you were looking at your baby and you were about to open your mouth to talk to that baby, did a nurse say, hold on, we've just got to do a test to see if she's ready for you to talk to her? <laughs> no, you just talk. And how long did you talk to that child before they talked back? 12 months. 18 months, two years. When that child was four weeks old and you were holding it and you go, well, I've been bloody talking to you for four weeks and you're not talking back yet, so why do I bother? <laughs> That's what happens for the girls with their AAC systems. Well, you haven't used it in four weeks. You've had this for four weeks. You haven't used it yet. You're not using it. You're not ready for it. It's not about mental age. I'm not saying the girls are four weeks old. I'm saying they've had four weeks of language. So how can you do it? When you and I see a symbol system, and it doesn't matter what symbol system it is, it looks like this. There is one way that if you lost your speech tomorrow, if you'd never seen these symbols before, there is one way that you know how to use this system, that you could pick it up and run with it and that is simply because you can read the labels. So it doesn't matter what symbol set it is, you can read those labels. You'd be okay. You'd be stressed, you'd be under severe performance anxiety, and you'd be trying to find things, but you can read the labels. Now very, very, very few AAC learners, when we give them an AAC system, can read the labels like you and I. So, to them it might look like this. If a child or an adult has some early literacy cues, they might be able to get some cues like you and I are doing now to say, ooh, I, okay, I get that. Go, mm. new, I've never seen a shoe with sparkles, but that might be new because it's a bit like that. But having early literacy cues and an emergent literacy level <coughs> doesn't support me with things like this. For our AAC users, who don't have any literacy levels yet, or very, very emergent and fleeting literacy levels yet, it looks like this. So now if I gave that to you today, how would you learn to use it? Two ways. People around you would use it to talk to you. They would have to, as they were talking English, if you can't take any cues from those labels, as they're talking English, they're saying, oh wow, Sophie got a prize. Oh, she's gonna go to a party. And you're thinking, okay, she said prize when she touched that, and party, that must be party. So people have to use it to talk to you. The other way you're going to learn that system is if you babble and play with it yourself. And every time you touch that, it says prize, prize and you learn that visual language. So when you have children who have brand new systems, can you expect performance straight away? No. It is nothing to do with intelligence. It is nothing to do with life experience. It is simply about language. Language and life experience. Language and people using it to talk to you. Isn't it absolutely bloody phenomenal that any kid learns to use an AAC system? And I want to read this to you because this is Jane Corston's quote and um, I have to remind um, many professionals of this all the time when they want to have communication time in the classroom. I'll read it out for those who are at the back. The average 18 month old has been exposed to 4,380 hours of oral language at a rate of eight hours per day from birth. 
A child who has a communication system and receives speech and language therapy two times a week for 20 to 30 minutes, and that's the only time the AAC is used, will reach the same amount of language exposure in their AAC language in 84 years. So, look, we have to be realists. Using AAC is not natural. You feel like a big old dork. There's performance anxiety for us. It's very difficult in the early days to get to eight hours a day of modelling. But we have to aim for more than two to 30 minute sessions a week. So when we think about language and how we have, how the child, typical children learn language, AAC learners learn language. It's a marathon. So when we're using the child's AAC system to talk to them, it's called aided language stimulation. So when you're doing random Googling and you're on Facebook and you're hearing all these acronyms thrown up, aided language stimulation. In the US, it's aided language input and it's modelling. You're simply modelling the language. The same that we do for our typically developing speaking children, we model speech for two years before they start speaking back. So in the early days, it's, it's all about us. It's receptive language in before we can expect expressive language, remembering that it all looks Greek to them. Um, in my life in advocacy, um, we have the I want a Toby problem. <coughs> and this comes from parents who say, I want a Toby. I've seen on Facebook, I've seen on blogs, I've seen on videos, I want a Toby. Now what I hear is a family saying, I desperately want that for my daughter. My daughter is missing out. I want that for her. I want language, I want opportunity, I want this thing. What school hears is, I want this really, 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 really expensive device. And I'm not sure that the child's ever gonna use it. So when we talk about this in our Angelman community, my colleague, Erin um, has a beautiful example. She says, okay, if your typically developing teenage son or daughter came up to you and said, I need an iPhone, want an iPhone. Your first response, well, no, you're not having a bloody iPhone. I didn't get one until I was 32. You're not having one. <laughs> now, if your son or daughter came up to you and said, okay, um, more and more of our school work is happening um, outside of, of school hours and I need to be able to keep up with what everyone's doing and where we're meeting. I need to be able to contact you at all hours. I need to be able to um, have maps easily accessible because now I'm driving to work and I want to know that I'm safe. I need to be able to keep up with social media and Twitter because I'm doing this project at the moment. These are three phones and iPad systems that meet all these needs. Can we discuss it? A parent is much more likely to say, yeah, sure, let's sit down and talk about it. So the I want a Toby problem actually needs to come back to how do I need something to fit into this vision? What do I need? My child needs a rich life. She needs to be able to chat to people. She needs to be able to, if I can't play with dollies, I need to instruct dollies. I need to be able to use eye gaze games to draw dollies. I need to be able to use eye gaze um, music to explore my creative side. Autonomy, I need some control over my life. I might be able to, have to be able to start social media if I'm a teenager, following One Direction on Twitter. I need some choices and I need language. Now, if the thing, the tool that can meet all these needs happens to be a Toby, you're going to get a much better reaction from the school. Because you're saying this is, this is the vision, <coughs> language, engagement, fun, play, social communication, joining in with cousins. If this Toby will do it, fabulous. Can you see the difference? Right. So that's what we're, we're talking about with advocating for very expensive devices. When you're looking at a language on a high tech system or a light tech system, you need to be able to ask yourself, what can I say with this? If the first two years of us having this in, the, in our house is about me providing that receptive input, what on earth can I actually say with it? 
Can I map language onto my daughter's emotions, affect her behaviour? So if I see her getting really agitated, can I write on there, it looks like you're saying this sucks, I need a break. If I don't have those words on there, it's not helpful. There are too many girls still with a Toby that has yes, no more finish. We have to bring the conversation back to language. So if I, what can I say with it? What can my child say with it? Who's putting the language on there? Is the teacher only putting more words on every week and I have no control over it? Who's in control? Can my daughter say, put that one in my system when we're out at the zoo and there's a meerkat there? Put it in, put it in. Me do. I want. Can I add words I need quickly, either in a light tech system or in a high tech system? Can I add in meerkat if it's not there? If my daughter or my student is so obsessed with meerkats and we're sitting at the zoo and I can't drag her away, I better be able to put meerkat in that system. Because I want something personally meaningful, engaging, that we can talk about later on. Um, so again, it's about us in the early days. It's about us. It's not about the children. We're providing receptive input. It takes time. Think about it all being Greek. It's going to take time. There was a world's most annoying song when I was a kid called I Can Sing a Rainbow. And listen with your eyes. I'm like, what a shibbly thing. You don't listen with your eyes. But when you're working with kids with complex needs, you do. You listen with your eyes. You're observing everything they do and you're listening to everything they have to say. So when we're saying to staff, I just want you to listen, but listen with your eyes. Watch everything that she does because I can guarantee everything she does for a reason. It may be a ret specific reason, it may be an apraxia reason, or it may be her beautiful personality that all the planets have aligned and she's managed to get it to sh shine out. Um, the verbal referencing of saying what you see. Oh, you're looking over there. Maybe you're saying, go there. Oh, I can see you're looking at the dolly. Maybe you'd like to play dollies. We're saying to the girls, I absolutely totally respect the way that you have communicated that, but if someone didn't understand, here's how you could have said it. There's a huge issue in a lot of our schools with um, conversation versus performance. And if you think about um, having that system of Greek in front of you, that that magically would mean that you could use it. We have a lot of um, schools that I go into and the parent, uh, the assistant, the speech therapist, the teacher will go up to the child and take their communication system and say, there you go. Come on. Well, my mum said she could do it on the table. I haven't seen it yet, but she said, come on, talk. <laughs> now, that person has to think, oh, shit, did I actually have something to say? <laughs> um, how, what do I say? How on earth do I say it? Oh, oh, he's, I don't think he's very well over there. Oh, sorry, you're still right here? It's like if we went up to a typically developing three-year-old and went, talk. <laughs> Three-year-old is like disappear behind the mother. You wouldn't get any conversation. They're like, I don't know what, what's wrong with you, but that's not how it works. <laughs> if we go up to that three-year-old and say, Oh, I really like that elsa dress, then suddenly you've got a three-year-old going, <laughs> <laughs> and they blather on about Elsa and Anna for the next five minutes, if they want to. But they also have the opportunity to not take up that communication turn. But there's been no pressure. So when we're working with early AAC users, it's pressure free, <coughs> it's not performance, it's not talk to me. I might go and say, oh, I really like that. That's fun. Or in most classrooms, I'm the devil's advocate, and I thought it was boring. Because most of the children I work with are the barometer for the classroom. If the child that I work with is bored, they're just very open about showing it. All the other kids are like, well, I'm really bored too, but I'm doing you know, maths in my head and I'm thinking about the cat that mum's promised me for Christmas. Or, oh, what about that bike that was in the Toys R Us catalogue? I just happen to work with the kids that make it very clear that this is the world's most boring thing and I'm over it. So I need to model that. It's boring. Boring. I want different. Um, five minutes to go, Lordy. <laughs> um, you know, I could, I could talk all day. So when we're talking about barriers, 
Most of the barriers come from perceptions, opportunities and access. The perceptions barriers we can fiddle around with. We can say, most of it comes from um, misconceptions about RET. It comes from the use of high functioning and low functioning. Now I can say about any of my friend's husbands, they are very low functioning husbands. They can't do pigtails, they can't fold washing. The fact that most of them are also fantastic dads, that they are very clever in their jobs. But if I just labelled them on their certain functions as a husband, low functioning. <laughs> so we have to be very careful about the language we use. We're all low functioning if we're in an environment where we don't understand the language, where we can't communicate, when we can't get our bloody body to do what it wants when we want it to do. So it's all about perception. Um, we have to keep saying to people, the vision is there. When people are saying, is she really doing that? Like, well, A, the system wouldn't activate if she wasn't doing it. But again, if she's babbling, think about, she's had this system for six months, so you've been talking for her six months. My God, she's a six month old, like language wise, that's babbling. We are gonna respond to that as if it's intentional because that's the only way she learns that A, we value her language and that what she says has meaning. So if everything's Greek to her and she's hitting pizza, pizza, oh, you want pizza? And she goes, eh. Oh, not pizza. Oops, maybe that was just an oops. But that's a good idea. Maybe we'll have pizza another night. We act as if it's intentional to teach the intention. Um, oh, what am I going to? Uh, do, uh, a big issue we have in schools still is that most teachers don't have a frame of reference for what full AAC looks like in a classroom. The majority of teachers understands, understand what PECS looks like at snack time and at morning circle time, but they don't have a frame of reference for what does this language thing look like in my class in the day. So that means we need to get in there as much as possible and model what they could say. Show videos of what's happening at home. Videos are so powerful. Um, and we have to remind, sorry, we have to remind teachers that AAC learners are going to blur everything out. And what I say to teachers is, okay, you can be the world's best kindy pre-primary teacher. You've got five year olds there, you're reading a book about a dinosaur. Someone is gonna put their hand up and say, I got a boogie. <laughs> Someone is gonna say, I have a cat. Book's not about cats, not talking about boogies. But when they're that early in their language, they blurt out what comes into their head. And those typically developing five year olds have had five years of receptive language input and three to four years of expressive language output and they're still blurting it out. So if you've got a, someone who's had an AAC system for six months, of course they're going to blurt it out. They're exploring, they're babbling. We teach <coughs> manners later on. We say, yes, I'm listening to that. Oh, it might not be time to talk about that now. If they're saying, well, I just, uh, she's not talking about what's on topic, so we'll just put it over there. No, you listen to what she has to say first. And we work on the assumption in our schools and classes that she's going to say, I'm going to puke on your face. So if she's going to say, I'm going to puke, I want her to say that. She might say, oh, I have a cat. Then I can say, it's not time to talk about that now. We can talk about your cat at lunchtime. But if her system isn't there, then she has no other option just to puke on me. And she might have known for five minutes that that was coming. So having the system there as much as possible, using it as much as possible. And I'm just going to race to our, oh, and this is, I need one minute, Bill. Yeah, it's all right, no, you're fine. You when we're developing a shared understanding, this is the issue. I don't see that at school. I don't see that, no, she, I've never seen her do that. She doesn't do it. When the dress went viral, people were saying, the people who saw it as gold, were looking out for all the other people that could see gold. Tell me I'm seeing the right thing. Oh, there must be others out there. Everyone else is full of nonsense. It has to be gold. The brown and bl blue and black people were saying the same thing about blue and black. Three days later, a scientist, scientist said, I wonder why we're seeing different things. This is what I see in schools. The speech therapist sees the dress as gold and white. So she goes and grabs all the evidence from everyone else who's seeing the dress as gold and white. The parents are seeing the dress as black and blue. They're seeing their daughter do amazing things at home. They're saying, she's doing it. And the teacher's saying, well, the dress is white and gold to me. I don't see it. 
we have to step back and say, why are we seeing different things? Is it the expectations in the environment? Is it the opportunities? Is it the way we're accessing it? Stop blaming the child. Let's think and look at us. So remember the dress. We all deal with our own realities, but we have to sometimes step back and go, mm, maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. Um, the groups that Sally's talked about um, this morning, the global knowledge base in the rec community is phenomenal. We have an issue in that the more the knowledge base of parents goes up, sometimes the more defensive professionals get because they're missing out. Funding means they can't go to professional development training. Parents know. Parents are getting into early childhood intervention saying, she's got this system, I've been modelling for 18 months, here it is. And the system's like, eh, we use PECs, sorry. So we have to support professionals to get out there on social media because this is where families are getting their information. So if you are a professional and you are not on social media, you are missing out on some of the best professional development you ever get in your life. Because the parents are the experts and you need to admit that and acknowledge that. So there's the Rett Syndrome Speech and Language Therapy and I'll post links in the Australian Rett Group so you can share that. RettSyndrome.org. Beautiful group, AAC Motivate Model move out, move out of the Way. Lots of Rett families here. I'll post these groups up in the Australian Rec Group and I might stick them out there so you can have a look. If you're a pod user, please, pretty please, join the pod and alternative access page because it's, it's something that um, there's core vocabulary pages, there, um, there's communicator groups. This is the group for the families who are using pod. If you are a family who has no idea what AAC in real life looks like, what modelling looks like when you've got a kid climbing on your head and the dog pooing in the corner, then this is the group for you because this is AAC, 100 AAC, day AAC challenge. It's a secret group, it's not for professionals, it's for families sharing real life videos of their modelling journey. There is no judgement, everyone knows like life just is a pile of poo some days and if everyone is alive at the end of the day then that's a good day. But some of the families are saying, guess what, I'm trying to model a bit each day and I'm going to share videos so we're in this solidarity together. Um, and I'll put some of the other ones up, but it's, I think it's this solidarity, community, and the fact that this is a long haul. This is a 50-year plan for most people with disabilities and AAC learners. It's a long, long plan. You need a tribe, a tribe to keep you going when things are good, a tribe to keep you going when things are really bad. So the online tribe is where we support families who are all over the shop. So I'm sorry I've taken up Tracy's time, but thank you very much for having me. Thank you.